goodness, though, you look good. Yeah, very attentive. Happy Friday, Baylor College of Medicine and Friends of Baylor. Well, the WHO, not, who has not handled this pandemic all that well, has given up. I've uh, decided they're not going to continue to fund studies looking for the origin of the, of the virus, mostly because China isn't cooperating. <laughs> What's new with that? But researchers are continuing to sample bats that are in the regions around China and uh, looking for intermediate hosts and testing of uh, archived water and blood samples that are predated the pan pandemic so we can see what the outbreak was. I, I don't know why there's a big deal because we already know from our group it started in bats and went to our friends, the pangolins, and then was transmitted in uh, the wet markets. And there was a bunch of studies we showed uh, that showed that. So I'm, I'm not sure what the value is anyway. What, it would have been nice if China cooperated and allowed us to look at samples of the bats in the caves around the region. That would have been very helpful. Uh, the world has still got a lot of COVID around. This is, uh, if you can see, blue is over 180 cases per 100,000. So US, Chile, Russia, Australia, lots of part of Europe. So it's still around. It's beginning to feel like we're getting what's known as endemic, sort of always around. In the United States, case numbers are continuing to improve. You can see we're, we have very little in the southeast in, uh, in the south in November. We had a little bit of a surge in January, and it's continuing to come down now in February. And nationally, uh, hospitalizations are down. You can see down here and also down in, in seven-year-olds. The only concern and the reason I'm beginning to feel like I, we're just going to have to live with this for a few, for several years, if not forever, uh, is that the wastewater data continues to go up a little bit, although it looks like it's beginning to plateau. And this probably reflects some of those centers around the country on that map where there's still some outbreaks. The dominant strain now is XBB 1.5. That's, you know, 80% of the strains. Uh, BQ1 is down to only about 20% or 10 or 12%. So the vast majority is XBB1, and we've been watching this play out for the last several weeks. You know, just three weeks ago I talked about it was really only in New England. Now it's all across the United States, the dominant strain, except for the South, actually even in the Northwest. It's about 50% in the Northwest. So we watched it go from dominant strain in the Northeast all the way across the country progressively each week. So it has definitely outcompeted the other strains. Here in Texas, we're pretty good. Our friends at Dimmick County remain low risk, and, and Harris County also low risk. So we're, we're in good shape. And here in the Texas Medical Center, the numbers are interesting. The case percentage rate is going down. Test case numbers down to 6.5% for hospitalized patients. But we're sort of stuck at 100 cases per day. You can see we really plateaued 100 cases per day admitted. And our wastewater data lo locally here in Houston is beginning to look like it's going to plateau. So one of the interesting things to me is uh, we have this persistent mortality. So if you look at it, um, it really has been flat at about 3,000 deaths, 3,100 3, deaths per week. And if you add, you know, if you think about that, that's 50,000, uh, that's about 150,000 deaths per year. If you look at the worst flu seasons, it's around 50,000 cases per year. So it's three times more lethal than flu, and it doesn't seem to be going away. And if you look at hospitalizations, last year there were about 700,000 hospitalizations for flu, and we're probably close to 7 million hospitalizations for COVID. So if it becomes endemic and we have to live with it, it's going to be a, a persistent cause of mortality here in the United States. Is, is there anything we can do about it? Well, of course there is. If you look at mortality, based on vaccine status, you're tenfold less likely to die from COVID if you've been vaccinated and, and boosted, and two and a half fold better if you're boosted versus just getting your standard series. So only 16% of the country has had their booster shots. This is gonna be around for a long time. It's not going anywhere. This is, should be all the data you need to go get your booster shot. So please think about that. Well, what about in young kids? This is all the data I've shown you is for 18 and over. What about younger kids? And we've been waiting for uh, data on the vaccine efficacy for kids. Uh, we were involved with these studies and therefore very excited about the conclusion. But we, this was a study that in, enrolled in, a, in a two to one, two uh, patients got vaccinated versus one placebo. 
and it was the Pfizer vaccine, three micrograms, a very low dose, in uh, three shots. So two 21 days apart, and then the third one after two months. And the most important thing here is you can see that the immune response was just as good as what you see in those people over the age of 16. So generated a good, good immune response. And this study was, during, was done during the Omicron wave, and you can see it was highly efficacious. So 70% efficacy, over 70% efficacy for kids in the age group of under two, between six months of two and two to four years of age. So, get, so kids should be vaccinated too. You know, and why did we want to not get this disease? Well, there was a good study looking at uh, CT scans in patients who got uh, uh, COVID. Uh, it was 144 patients over the age of 60, which is where, you know, that age group that is uh, high risk for mortality. And they looked at six, 12, and 24 months pulmonary function tests and TC scans. And the, the sad thing about it is 39% had evidence of persistent uh, interstitial lung disease. And of that, 23% had fibrotic changes. And fibrotic changes don't go away. So that's one of the reasons why people will have a persistent impact from long COVID. And so here's a CT scan that's normal. And this is what it looks like when you have fibrotic changes in the lung. This is improved by vaccination. So you want to, it, it, over the age of 60, high risk for mortality, high risk for hospitalizations, tremendous benefit from vaccination. So another reason to get vaccinated. Well, there are other viruses going on in the U.S. right now. Norovirus, my favorite reason to never go on a cruise. Norovirus infects everybody if it's on a cruise. Uh, highly contagious GI uh, complaints. And of course, the winter time and early spring is when norovirus is around and we're having a, a particularly bad norovirus season. You can see tremendous amount of norovirus. But some good news on, on respiratory syncytial virus. This is, um, this is really important. Uh, you know, it, it's one of the diseases that causes uh, mortality in adults over the age of 60. And we've been very, uh, it's been very difficult to get an effective R R RSV vaccine. And one of the reasons is, is getting the right confirmation of an important protein that would be immunogenic enough to prevent you from getting the virus. So there is a study by GlaxoSmithKline looking at uh, a stabilized uh, protein that causes fusion. It's the protein that binds to the cell and causes fusion. And it's been very immunogenic and very effective. And so they did a study looking at uh, people over the age of 60 and during RSV season, which was just recently, showed a tremendous benefit and protection as you can see the vaccinated patients in terms of getting uh, lower respiratory attack disease versus placebo. So that should be a big breakthrough actually. We've not had an effective RSV vaccine. So for people over the age of 60, I would expect that every flu, every flu season, every winter, we'll start getting RSV vaccines in addition to your COVID vaccine and your flu vaccine. Uh, in addition, there's a really interesting study, again, that we participated in here at Baylor College of Medicine in our pediatrics uh, department and our maternal fetal uh, medicine group looking at uh, pregnant mothers. It's also a similar uh, domain, the, the fusion protein, was uh, used to, to vaccinate uh, pregnant mothers. And they had a tremendous uh, uh, benefit. It was, uh, this is a Pfizer vaccine. And it was uh, effective 81% uh, of the time at preventing RSV in infants, which is a big issue for in mortality of infants. So that, that was a really big breakthrough. As I've said, we've never really had effective RSV vaccines before. Now we have one for uh, older people and one for uh, pregnant mothers. So I want to end today with a bunch of shout outs. First of all, we did our first heart transplant at the DeBakey VA. We're the only, this is the second VA in the nation to do it. Uh, we're one of the leading uh, VA hospitals, the DeBakey VA, in, in terms of transplant. We do also do kidney transplants uh, there, but it's really exciting that we're the second one to do a heart transplant, successful and you know, very, very well, turned out very well for the patient. We also uh, compete very well for the CPRIC grants. These are the cancer prevention uh, grants that, um, that, that are sponsored by the state. We had about $6 million in new grants that came from CPRIC. I want to also thank our residents and fellows. This is, uh, uh, is the annual day uh, for recognizing our training uh, physicians. Uh, it's sponsored by the Gold Humanism Honor Society, and it's really, they're a very important part of our healthcare delivery system. Uh, our trainees uh, who are becoming the, the specialists of the uh, future. So big shout out to them. And finally, <laughs> we were not good at football, but we were very good at rodeo. 
So Houston Rodeo is on the way. Uh, we, we had Howdy come visit us. Howdy scared Lily a little bit, but we got a picture of, her, of Howdy hanging out with, the, with Lily, and we're really excited about coming and uh, uh, all attending the rodeo. So have a great weekend. I can't wait to see you next week.